Just an utter embarrassment and a return to home ice. Sabres lose big to Ottawa. Coming up here in Locked On Sabres. Your Locked On Sabres, your daily podcast on the Buffalo Sabres. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thanks for making Locked On Sabres your first listen every day, free and available wherever you get your podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is presented by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets with any $5 bet. That's 200 bucks. If your bet wins, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. I appreciate all of you coming back here to listen to this show because There is nothing more demoralizing right now as a Buffalo sports fan than thinking about what your hockey team is currently looking like. A 6-2 shellacking to the Ottawa Senators. The Sabres fall, and it got ugly quick in their return to home ice. I warned everybody, and listen, I'm a part of the machine, so I'm definitely at fault too, but go have a good homestand because if you don't, then we're going to have to start wondering and some snarky comments might be made about uh, if you're mad and offended still by the fans booing. And listen, I took my turn. I stepped up to the plate. I I swung at my snark snarky tweet, uh, which was, are the, uh, are the players okay with the Sabres booing? Sabres fans booing them at the end of this period because they were down 4 nothing in the first nine minutes of action. We'll talk about it. The goaltending in this game, you had a bad start for Lukanen, and then from the moment Levi went in to the end, he was fantastic. So we'll get to that as well coming up here on the show. But yeah, 4 nothing in the first nine minutes. Ukapeka Lukanen in this game gave up five goals on nine shots, and that is on the heels of a Saturday game in Edmonton where he gave up five goals in the third period. Now, in the Edmonton game, his guys quit on him. Completely, utterly quit on him. I don't know that they quit on him in this one as much as they just weren't ready to play. They showed up not ready to play. Lukanen didn't help them out. There were a couple that were his fault. He seemed to be fighting the puck early on. At one point, there was one that didn't even go in the back of the net. It was just a soft wrist shot from a ways out and looking in with his shoulder pops it up in the air. Doesn't know where it is. It lands right there in front of him. He was lucky that there wasn't a Senator there for that one, or it could have been four, nothing even earlier. So looking in not great. I got some numbers comparing Levi to looking in on the season to get to coming up in a little bit, but this was more about the overall team, not ready to play. Paul Hamilton had a funny line on uh, on my show on WGR on Thursday morning, which was, Devin Le- Devin Levi showed up as the only player ready to play, and he wasn't even supposed to play. Nobody looked ready to play. Jack Quinn, in his return, didn't go great. Didn't win my parlay, obviously, at the Sabres money line, but Quinn was a minus three on the night. He got just over 15 minutes of ice time, um, but that's not on him. I mean, it's his first game back. You know, Peyton Krebs had an opportunity. There he was in the first period. That's a guy that I've been waiting to see play with better line mates so we can start to finally figure out what he is. And, hey, man, you get a breakaway and the game's getting away from you. You got to score there. And Krebs is not able to. Um, you know, it's just an overall effort from the team that I thought was lackadaisical in their own end. Your two best defensemen or who you're supposed to be your two best defensemen. How about the top three? Darlene, Byram, Power. All make big mistakes in the first period. You had uh, Darlene miss the puck on the Boris Cat Choke uh, goal. I don't even know how to pronounce the guy's name. He's a newer guy for Ottawa. Uh, Darlene cuts out in front to defend and he gets the perfect position and then takes just a weak swipe at it and it doesn't get anything on it. And then it goes right to the Senator and it goes into the back of the net. Like, come on. That's if you're going to be a Norris trophy level defenseman, you can't let plays like that happen. Owen power lackadaisical along the wall. There are some plays with him that just drive me mad. No urgency along the wall. And it's stolen away. 
It's thrown out in front, and Ottawa scores again. And Bo Byram got fined for this already. They didn't score on the power play, but, you know, this one I guess I won't throw as much towards Byram. Byram with a big check interference on, I believe it was Parker Kelly uh, in the first period. He just throws a check kind of out of nowhere. It was clear interference. He got fined $5,000 for it. Brady Kachuk went after him a little bit later on in the second period because he was upset about it. So I guess you know, it's Byram showing frustration. I can't be too mad at him for that because that's what everybody really wants to see from this team is frustration. And other than Byram throwing that check, I mean, Dalene kind of threw his glove in a guy's face at one point too. No pushback, no fight back. And what's being thrown around a lot by fans right now are words like mental weakness and soft and immature. It's it's the youngest team in the league still. They have experience, yes, but it is the youngest team in the league, and they look like a mentally fragile team uh, in general. And that could even be related to the fan stuff if you want, but let's keep it on the ice here and just say they don't respond well in these spots. And that's twice now in a week where that's happened, where a five-goal period has gone against you. And that is letting things spiral out of control. And I wonder, does Don Granato feel like he has the answers? Do they still, does he still have the the ear of the team? I mean, they act like they do. They talk like he does, but they certainly don't play like it. They don't play like, you know, they're, they're trying to save their head coach's job. Um, that's got to start happening. I, I do wonder, you know, there's an article in the Buffalo News this morning from Mike Harrington. The first uh, article that I've seen that's pretty much just called for Don Granato to be fired. I know a lot of fans have done that, but Harrington was writing about that. And say what you will about about him, but that's, you got, you got questions being asked. Someone's writing about Granato's job security, and I don't know that there's a, a that there's any end of the season that could get me to think they're actually going to do it. I'm very hard pressed to see them actually doing it. But do these games matter? Nine games left, and do these games matter to his job? Could it go so poorly in the final weeks of the season that Granado could coach his way out of the job and really make them act? And I'll tell you this. I don't expect a lot of more a lot more nights to look like what that just looked like against Ottawa, but that's what it looks like. That's the game. If you get a stretch of those, then the coach maybe could lose his job because it would get so embarrassing, so bad that they feel like they have to act. Ralph Kruger. The Sabres did not want to fire Ralph Kruger that COVID season. They didn't. They had actually just given him more voice in the front office, in the organization. Because he had had front office experience in the NHL as a scout, if you will. And then, of course, in other sports and soccer, he had been a president. So they started to give Kruger more of a voice. And they didn't want to fire him. He just had a contract extension, I believe. But 18-game losing streak, like, come on. All right, it gets to a point where you've got to do, you've got to act. And is there something like that that could happen for Granado down the stretch where it's We don't want to fire him, but look at this. We got to act. We can't do nothing. Maybe that happens down the stretch, but you're going to have to have a few more games at least that look like what that Ottawa game just looked like. An abysmal performance from the Sabres. Uh, You are off for multiple nights. You had only had one game in five days. You were well-rested, and that's what you looked like on the ice. Total embarrassment from that team last night to let that happen. I feel for the fans that went to that game. There were 14,000 fans as the announced attendance. I did not go to this game, but I feel for a fan. I had one texter text into me that they had just bought the hot dog of the day. They grabbed a beer and they went to sit down. It was three, nothing. By the time they sat down, it was three, nothing. It gets to four in the first 10 minutes. and. It's a it's a Wednesday night. I don't know. Maybe you you and the wife got a babysitter to go out to this game, made plans to do it. You drive downtown, you pay for your parking, you walk to the arena, you get settled, and within 10 minutes, you could realistically already leave the game. You could just poof, just blow the night up. Like, let's go do something else. Let's go to a show. Let's go to a movie. I don't know. Do something other than this because 
from the time it's four nothing on, there's no there's no point. You got 51 minutes of hockey that nobody cares about because you already know what the result of the game is going to be, uh, and why just make yourself upset. So I would have left. You know, depending on what you would have spent for tickets, I know that's a part of this too. Um, but if you got tickets for cheap, you know, could have been using the uh, game time app. Uh, I would have left. I would have left in the first 10 minutes. And honestly, you know, Saber fans should throw like a walkout of this team. You know, that, that happens in soccer. Manchester United fans did this uh, a couple of years ago. A walkout. D- just just walk out. Don't come back for the second period. Empty arena. P- a completely empty arena for the second period. Really send a message to this franchise. Um, but of course, you know, I don't. that doesn't happen a lot in, uh, in hockey or in uh, North American sports. You see it once in a while in soccer. When we come back, one positive that came out of this game. It wasn't all negative. J.J. Paterka overtook Jeff Skinner for the team lead in goals, by the way. Connor Clifton scored for the second game in a row. But some positive news in that Devin Levi looks really good down the stretch here. We'll talk about Levi. I got some numbers on Levi and how the, I think they should operate with him down the stretch of the season because that's a tough one between here and Rochester. That's coming up here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. We are presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. It is tourney time. It is the Sweet 16 and there's a lot going on. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your $5 bet wins. It's $200 bucks to use on the point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all with a future. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Thanks for making us your first listen. Be sure to make your next listen, Locked On Sports Today. If you are tired of all that shouting, ESPN, Fox Sports 1, make the switch to Locked On Sports Today. Free 24-7 streaming channel. It's available on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Sticky Joe DiBiase here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Devin Levi was fantastic. After coming in for relief of Uka Pekalukadin, and after that nine-minute goal that made it four to nothing by Jacob Chikrin, Granado goes to Levi. Levi plays 50 minutes. He stops 31 of 32 shots. The only goal he let in was that Brady Kachuk goal in the final minute of the first period that made it five to nothing. And Levi made a bunch of incredible saves moving side to side. Again, he is a fun goalie to watch because of the athleticism. He was fantastic in this game. That is two straight unbelievable games by Devin Levi. Two straight. He was incredible last week in which, who was the opponent in that game? Uh, the opponent in that game were oh, Vancouver. The Vancouver had the highest expected goals against the Sabres in a game in 10 years. And Levi turned away all but two goals. So he was amazing in that game. He was great in this game. And if you look at goals saved above expected per 60 minutes at moneypuck.com, Levi now ranks out of 71 qualifying goaltenders. Levi ranks 10th. 10th. He has saved eight and a half goals above expected on the season. He's at 0. .408 for every uh, 60 minutes that he plays. That is right there with Thatcher. He's between Thatcher Demko and Linus Allmark. He is having a season. And now, I mean, Lukanen's last two games have really crushed his numbers. That Edmonton game and this game last night. But Lukanen now ranks 23rd. He's at .182. So, He's still great. He's still been very strong on the season. Over eight goals saved of expected for him. But Levi, in a limited, a more limited sample, has been very strong. And if you're wondering, like, why does Levi have a very low save percentage, but the goals saved above expected numbers are very strong? Well, part of the reason why is if you look at expected goals against average, So the expected amount of goals that you're supposed to allow every game based on the quality of shots that you see, who the shooters are, you know, how strong the opponent is, um, where the shots come from. I think is really the most important thing, though, here, uh, how many scoring chances. 
Who? What? How many goals should you let in on average based on what you face? Levi, second highest in the NHL. The second only Capo Kakinen is higher than Devin Levi is. He's expected to allow 3.57 goals per game. So he's getting a hard test every time he's in there. And for comparison, Lukanen on the season, 56th highest out of 71. So Levi is second. Lukanen is 56. That's almost like strength of uh, chances that you face. So a lot of it is he's just got a tough assignment. And that's why save percentage looks lower than some of his advanced numbers. And I, my eyes tell me the same thing. I think Levi looks very strong. I think he looks well-polished. You know, maybe his, his worst stretch of the year was when he came back from injury. He started the year early on. He was okay uh, against the Rangers and the Islanders. He played those first four games of the season. He got hurt against Calgary, finished that game, and then missed a couple of weeks. And then once he came back, he struggled a little bit, you know, I don't know this, but maybe there's something to be said for coming back from the injury. He wasn't all the way back yet, but he went down to Rochester, became one of the best goalies in the AHL all season long, if not the best goalie in the AHL. Then he came back up to Buffalo and in three appearances, or is it two appearances? Uh, Really two appearances in two appearances since being called up. He's been fantastic in both of them. So what I would do with Devin Levi down the stretch is can he, really earn a 1B type of role for next year for planning purposes, as opposed to you're the clear cut number two to Uka Pekka Lukanen. Maybe it doesn't matter. I mean, often coaches will just go with who the hot hand is. So how much of this rest of season matters to how much he'll play next year? Probably not a lot, but they've got four home games coming up. They've got one of those is a back-to-back. I'd play Levi twice. They're out of the playoff race now. It's over. So I don't need to hammer Lucan in every single night. Maybe they want to get Comrie a game because he's really getting a, a tough deal here where he's not even allowed to play. He's practicing with the team. He's not allowed to play in Rochester either. He's just sit, hanging out doing nothing. Maybe they give Comrie a game just to be friendly to him. Uh, I, though, think you can start to lay off of Lucan in a little bit. Don't drive him into the ground at the end of the season for nothing. You're out of the race. His The story of his season is written. Lukanen's been incredible. One of the best goalies in the league since January 1st. One of the best goalie seasons in general in the league all season long. His story for the season has been written. You, I'm not saying bench him for the year, but maybe just, you know, turn it down from an 11 to like a 5 and let Levi get back in the rotation and let him get some games in the NHL before inevitably sending him back down to Rochester to go on a playoff run with the Amherst. That's what I would do. You've got a Friday, Saturday against New Jersey, Toronto. I would give Levi one of those two games. Then I would give him one of the two games next week against Washington and Philly. I would just keep going that way. I would just keep going every other Lucan and Levi, maybe a mixed Comrie in at the end of the season uh, once you send Levi back. But for the next five, six games, I'd like to see Levi get three of them, if I'm being honest. Lucan, in, again, it's not a criticism of him. I just think we already know what he is. He's earned the right to be called a number one goaltender, and he's earned the right to have a, a nice size bridge contract. I, I don't know what you gain by having to play – Lucan in eight of the last nine games. Play him five. Play him four of the last nine games. I don't think that would be a problem. When we come back, uh, some messages from the group chat. From the group chat, I asked a question to texters that's going to be a subject I'm going to talk about more coming up on a, on, a, on a future show about the three forward prospects that are coming up in the organization. I'll let you know what some of our texters think about the timeline of the young guys and when they're going to get here. That's coming up here on the Locked on Sabres podcast. We are presented here on the show by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has got everything you need to maintain your vehicle, level it up to peak performance, superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 
million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay guaranteed fit, your parts guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay motors, you're burning rubber, not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to us customers. Final segment here in the Locked On Sabres podcast. Sabres fall 6-2 to two to the Ottawa Senators. Next up for them, Friday night hosting New Jersey. Saturday at home against Toronto. I'm expecting a Maple Leaf takeover once again for that one. The last time the Maple Leafs, though, were in town. Uh, the Sabres won that game 9-3, to three, and that was a lot of fun. And listen, while they're out of the playoff race, it's always fun to send Leaf fans home upset. So... That's one game I know I will be fully invested in seeing the Sabres win. In fact, I might even try to get to that game. Uh, We'll see. So that's coming up on Saturday after the Sabres play New Jersey on Friday. From the group chat, if you want to become a Locked On Sabres uh, sortie a, on our text line, go to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Sabres, and we will head to the group chat for my question of the day. And the question, or really the take of the day, is about Matt Savoy, Yuri Kulik, and Isaac Rosine. All three are on a timeline to where they should be in the NHL next year. Matt Savoy, two years since he was drafted, he has been dominant this season in the WHL. He's moving around all these teams. I can't even remember which team he's on because, again, this is like the third WHL team. Uh, Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw Warriors. He got traded there, um, I believe, this this year, this offseason. He has 47 points in 23 games. He's over two points per game for them. Before that, with the Wild, the the Wenatechi Wild of the WHL, he had 24 points in 11 games. So he's well, he's a good amount over two points a game uh, for the season. He's above and beyond that level of hockey. He's he's better than that. By the way, I didn't even mention, he only got six AHL games in earlier for the Amherst, but he had five points in six games there um, for that weird three-minute game for the Sabres and got sent back. Uh, so Savoy, like, he's ready. I think so. I mean, he didn't get a training camp this past season because of the injury and development camp. Um, but if he has a good development camp, Like, next in the timeline for him, I mean, I think Buffalo makes more sense, given that he was a top 10 pick. Yuri Kulik and Isaac Rosin, both of which have played two full seasons in the AHL. Um, And Kulik maybe has been better than Rosin, but both have been very good for them. So what's next for both of them? I mean, especially Rosin, because Rosin is now 21 years old. Like, it's time to go here. Like it's time to it's time to get in the lineup and let's see what you are. But does anyone expect or even want them to carve out not one, not two, but three spots in the lineup for prospects next season for three rookies? Do they want a fourth of the forward lines to be rookies? And that doesn't include Zach Benson, who will still only be 19 years old next season. I mean, I don't think that's the move. I don't think the move is uh, the old, the way we're going to get better, guys. We're just going to plug in the young guys, and we're going to hope that that works. I mean, there's got to be veteran trades to be had here. So that was kind of my question. Like, you know, what what's the move here? Do you trade them? Who do you trade? How many spots do you want to create? Because in my mind, one. That's the right answer. One spot gets created next season for one of those three. And maybe they trade another one. Uh, one texter sends in, I always go back to thinking that Kevin Adams' biggest mistake was making all three first round picks in Savoy uh, and then the other two. I look at the roster and to me, Benson, Savoy, Oslin, and Rosine are all the same profile of player. They need to trade at least one, if not two of them, to get different types of skill. Organizationally, they lack elite forechecking and play along the boards. I'm looking at a Martin Nietzsche trade from Carolina and a trade up in the draft to go get Caden Lindstrom. Uh, I'm not familiar with Caden Lindstrom. I'll talk. Uh, I'll ask uh, Hadi Kalakash, uh, locked on NHL prospects, next time he's on. But it's a good point. Like, Did they make a mistake drafting all of these guys and not trading away one of their or two of their picks at some point in time? The answer is yes. 
in the last three years, they should have traded one of these first round picks away. Not, not all these guys should be in the system right now. One of them shouldn't be. And in the name of getting a 25, 26 year old stud that you could have added within the last couple of years, that that's really a good answer. I think Uh, other answers to this commentary about, you know, these guys package. This is about an idea for this off season package, the 10th pick in the draft plus Rosine and maybe another lower level prospect. And you got to get a decent player in return. The only downside is that our defensive prospects pipeline is pretty weak, especially if you expect Ryan Johnson to be a full-time NHL guy next year, outside of Ryan Johnson, our next two best defensive prospects are Maxim Streback, who's 18 in Michigan state uh, and Gavin McCarthy. So I agree with the defensive prospect point. You know, Rosine would be the one to trade, right? I don't know where he fits. I think Kulik's ahead of him, but Rosine, and maybe even Savoy's ahead of him, but Rosine's the oldest. He's 21. Like, time to go. Time to figure out what you are. And he still carries some value. So I agree. He's the one I think that more than any others is worthy of being traded right now. Go find a team that is ready to rebuild or is in a rebuild and is looking to move a 25 to 29 year old, very good veteran player. And go trade them Isaac Rosine. This, hey, this guy, we just have too many prospects. We don't have room for him to play in our lineup. He's ready to take a shot at the NHL level. You've got a spot to play him in the NHL. We don't. That's the type of move, and I think he's the right player to uh, to pick out here is Isaac Rosine. Uh, I would give one other texter. I would keep Savoy and trade the rest. The last thing this team needs is youth. We need two good veterans. I like that a lot. Uh, this comment is not about our question of the day. Um, it's more about Granado. One texter. If we made a run and missed the playoffs by three to five points, I could see the organization making the argument that Granado deserves another year. I have a feeling we'll be out by eight, 10 in a year where the wild card teams are not especially strong. There is no excuse not to fire him besides not wanting to pay him. I think that's mostly right. I will point back to an episode I did last week on this show. Just want to mention this again. I do think a, sm- a part of the reason, too, is Granado is very popular amongst players, not just with the Sabres, but league-wide. And I do wonder if part of the reason they would want to hold on to Granado is he's one of their only way, only tools to get talented players to come here. I don't think that should be num- the priority, like the number one reason why you can't fire a guy. Um, but I do think that's worth mentioning here. The paying him part, though, is probably more more important uh, to the organization. They just signed him to an extension. It hasn't even kicked in yet, and they're going to fire him? Hey, maybe. I, I just I don't think there's a very likely chance of it. All right, it's going to do it for us today here on the Locked on Sabres podcast. Come back tomorrow. We'll talk more about the Devils. The Devils are having a similar fall that the Sabres have had. The difference is the Devils season last year was a lot better than the Sabres season last year was. So what's going on with New Jersey? They fired Lindy. And I'm ready to call them idiots because it clearly has not worked firing Lindy. He was not the biggest problem with the Devils. So we'll compare the two teams, Sabres and Devils, and we'll get more of your texts in on uh, the subject matter about the prospects. So come back for tomorrow's show. Be sure to check us out on YouTube. If you are not one that watches the show and you're looking for that option, go to YouTube, search Locked on Sabres. You can find us there. Hit us up on our text line. If you're not signed up already, join subtext.com slash locked on uh, Sabres to sign up. It's the price of a cup of coffee. If you go to the place that I go to get coffee, it's cheaper than a uh, than a cup of coffee. I've got a problem with that. All right, that's going to do it for us today here on the Locked on Sabres podcast. Be sure to check out Locked on Sports today. The tournament fires back up tonight. If you're looking for some college hoops coverage, NBA playoffs are getting close, and of course, you've got a lot of stuff happening in the NFL. Be sure to check out Locked on Sports today, 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube and Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Talk to you tomorrow here on Locked on Sabres.